righty. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around while we were dealing with a little bit of technical uh, confusion. Thank you, Lillian, for, for panicking and grabbing a computer. I appreciate it very much. Um, I am Cal Peterson. I am a uh, an instructor here at the university. I also am super interested in tabletop. I run a game and participate in a game um, that is local. Uh, we've been playing together for about 10 years, which always surprises everybody that I tell that to. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today was a little bit of world building stuff. Um, I'm going to go into some very basics um, and then I'm going to try and leave some time at the end for Q&A discussion, tips and tricks, how to's, because um, I know that there's at least one other person in the room I'm going to pick on who has designed their own homebrew world that can kind of contribute if we need that. Um, so this is Dungeons, Dragons and everything else, World Building 101. Um, this came about because I wanted to talk about the sort of way that we make fictional worlds, um, and especially fictional worlds for tabletop. I have the most experience with D&D, &D, but a lot of this stuff is pretty applicable regardless of whatever system you choose to use. Um, so what is world building? World building is the background for the world and that can be for a homebrew world that you're making from scratch that can also be fleshing out things that are pre-made if you've got a curse of straw module or something like that you still have to make the world feel alive even if you have a list of npcs and plot points and enemies and whatnot ready to go from that module um, so it's a little bit different than setting because you are also building up uh, things to do with the culture, the history of the world, things that go outside of the sort of physical locations that the character is going to be in. Um, it's a building block of story, sort of like plot or character and conflict. We see all of these things coming together to sort of make a homebrew world or to make a pre-made world feel more lived in, feel more alive. Um, and we see it all over the place. We see it in everything from novels, which is sort of the traditional area that a lot of world building pulls from, to things more like the, in the modern day, the MCU, where we see cross-references between properties, between shows, between movies that are helping to establish this setting and this shared culture that exists within that particular franchise. Um, we also even see it in more modern media. We see it in things like TikTok. There are, there are creators out there that are creating their own sort of setting and world. I'm thinking of, especially the tabletop community is really good at this and, and bringing together things like um, specific characters that they've made and that interact with other creators too. Um, okay, so what do academics say about world building? I'm going to go into this very, very briefly because this is not a, you know, like professional, like big academic conference level panel. But there are a couple of things that I found that were really cool that I just sort of want to share. Um, we definitely see the evolution of tabletop in academia and in schools more. Um, Wizards of the Coast uh, released a packet of activities and and tie-in lesson plans for D, D for the elementary and middle grades not terribly long ago that's still available online um the other two the, that i wanted to pull from are uh jeff martin and gretchen sneegas uh in their article critical world building toward a geographical engagement with imagined worlds this is a paper that is looking at <clears throat> world building from the perspective particularly of geography as a discipline and using sort of some of the elements of world building and analyzing world building to um, talk about the ways that 
we mirror real world things, even in fiction. Um, they say speculative worlds inevitably act, enact a politics, even if implicitly. The production, circulation, and consumption of imagined worlds does not occur in a social vacuum. Rather, these practices inform and are informed by our histories and historical present. So when we're thinking about world building, we know that things in the real world are real world are going to impact that. We know that a lot of fantasy is formed out of sort of the history of Europe and England especially, and raised a lot in, you know, things like mid the medieval era. And some folklore is privileged more than others in what we consider sort of classical fantasy. Um, so that's going to impact the ways that we build worlds if we want it to, if we let it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but the reason that we see things like orcs and goblins and elves are you can tie those directly to cultural things that exist in the real world. Tolkien and the sort of fantasy genre of novels, especially. Um, so. And the other article that I would like to sort of focus on is uh, an article by Brian McKenzie called Dungeons, Dragons, and Digital Writing, a Case Study of World Building. This is actually the paper that made me think about this panel. Um, and he, use, he talks in his paper about using world building tools in a, an intensive writing class. And so he's using um, things like creating a shared wiki to build worlds. And he has groups of students in this paper and this sort of case study that he did for a class um, split off into groups and basically design their own homebrew worlds. Um, I think, I believe that he had three that decided to do a more traditional like d d style setting. There was one group that did a sci-fi setting, and then there was an, uh, one more group that did a different system that was still sort of fantasy based. Um, and he had students apply their academic knowledge of, you know, their major, things that they have studied, uh, classes they've already taken to construct fictional worlds by having them write articles that went with their major, their specialty, or their interests. Um, and so he gave them a background in how wikis are put together, some things like Wikipedia or Fandom Wiki. And then they had a class, a set of class wikis that they contributed to and built for this final project. Um, and he uses a system from Trent uh, Hergenrader that we're going to talk about in a minute, which is what these are. This the collaborative world building deck. There are a few left on the back table there if anybody wants one. Um, they are Creative Commons, so that I'm not like stealing anybody's work. Um, I'm citing him as is appropriate for their license. Um, and so what this world building deck does and what I was really interested in, that's the wrong direction. Oh, no, no, there we go. Um, and so when we think about world building, there's some options for what we're going to do. One of the big questions that you that is kind of initial that you want to think about is what kind of story do you want to tell? So what you're going to end up building by yourself or maybe with your players is going to be dependent upon what you want to do. A, a story that is sort of darker in tone and based on something like Game of Thrones is going to be very different than a story that's based on, you know, the Marvel movies or something like John Hughes. Um, there are professional tables that do this really well. Um, Dimension 20 is the one that immediately sprung to mind for me um, because they've got genre-based campaigns in their sort of catalog that are based on specific properties. Um, Fantasy High of, for them is based on The Breakfast Club and uh, A Crown of Candy was a Game of Thrones inspired campaign. So those are things that you can pull from if you want to emulate something else. Now, if you want to start whole cloth and pull from just your own brain or you and your players' brains, that's something you can do too. 
Um, and there are tons of resources out there. Again, we're going to take a look at the uh, the system that Harrigan Rainer uses um, and apply it to my game because I think it's a really interesting way to analyze it. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff out there. Sage Advice is one of the oldest and most popular sources out there. Um, social media has become a great place if you could, uh, for specific communities. Um, TikTok and Tumblr and and Facebook groups that are focused on these topics can be a great place to bounce ideas, find ideas that people have you know just sort of put out into the world and said, hey, use this if you'd like. So those are all available. And talking, of course, talking to people in the community, coming to conventions and panels, I um, and doing things like interacting with people in those groups. You know, most people, if you message them about something that they put together, whether it's a tabletop game or a book or whatever, they're going to be excited to talk about it. So you can message message people and ask like, hey, how did you do this? Do you care if I use this thing that you posted? Because most of the time, especially if you're not, you know, trying to pass it off as yours and make money off of it, people are generally pretty accepting of using, of letting you use whatever you would like for building tabletop. Um, <clears throat> Let's take a look at the Harrigan Raider though. Um, so this is the world building deck. It actually goes with a book by Harrigan Raider called Collaborative World Building. And this is a text that sort of breaks down step by step some of the things that you can do to create a homebrew world or create a world together with your players, sort of regardless of whatever your system might be. Um, and the color deck, which I was going to try and order for this panel, is gorgeous. It was not going to get here until May, so I'm probably going to order that later. But um, in the deck, you've got uh, several categories of things that you're going to want to consider when you're talking about building a world. Um, there are governance, economics, social relations, and cultural influences. And all of these get a number that it represents how prevalent they are in your world and you can just shuffle these and use it sort of like a tarot deck almost and you also get trending cards which are going to be whether the particular sphere the particular thing within one of those four four categories is trending and you can decide whether it's trending up or down sort of based on the numbers that are assigned with it. Um, and so using this, you can pretty quickly put together a setting. Um, one of the things that he recommends on the, the sort of handout sheet is don't change numbers because then you get you get into making an idealized world, which we'll talk again a little bit more about with mine in a minute, because um, I didn't have this when I was creating our our setting for our game. Um, but these are some of the resources and tools that are out there and available. And a lot of the stuff on American Writers website, which I have down here at the bottom, is just collaborativeworldbuilding.com. Um, is free. The the PDF that I printed this deck from is free. The and he also has some worksheets that I didn't bring out that are a way to help organize things, especially if you are working in a group to build a set. Um, and I am the the book looks excellent. I've read excerpts from it. I'm going to get the whole thing probably very soon, but it seems like a very cool way to go about building worlds. So one of the things that, that often comes up when you are doing world building is how do you organize it? Because potentially you're going to have a lot of information. You're going to have settings, characters. You're going to have history stuff that comes up to say nothing of perhaps player backstories that you will also have to incorporate. So there's a couple, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Old school methods, you know, you know, these are these are fairly low tech, fairly mm, easily accessible. You can, you know, pen and paper, lots of docs, lots and lots and lots of documents. Um, and if any of my players see spoilers in any of these titles, no, you didn't. Um, <laughs> But there are also a lot of new tools out there as well. Um, there are 
wikis and wiki builders that are specifically designed for world building now. Uh, one of them that I looked at a long time ago was called World Anvil, and it's out there and has a bunch of different features. You can link between articles. You can link between different topics. You can build timelines for your world. So it's really cool. There's a free version of it that is, that is accessible without any kind of subscription. You just have to create a login. Um, and then of course there's premium features that you can unlock with it as well. Um, there are also organizers for things like world maps. Uh, there are a bunch that are interestingly released on Steam right now. Um, Canvas of Kings is a good old school looking map. It looks sort of like a parchment style map. Um, Dungeon Alchemist and uh, excuse me, Tailspire both use um, are used more for specific encounters. They're very small. They're not whole worlds. They are individual places, perhaps battles, perhaps, you know, specific set pieces that you want your players to be able to see in 3D. Um, another one that is popular that I've seen used for tabletop, but is actually something that uh, one of our group uses for novel writing is Scrivener. Um, and people you, I've seen, People online talk about using that tool, and the person in our group really likes it for novel writing as well. So that's another tool that's out there um, and available. Okay, so let's talk. We'll talk a little bit about my game, then we'll open it up into in, into discussion. So the the name of um, the setting that I came up with is Latira. Um, the way that I came up with that name was a left shark joke or nun pizza left beef joke uh, for any of you that were on Tumblr back in the day. Um, and so I took left Terra. Terra is another word for Earth uh, and made Latira. If none of if some of my players didn't know that, that's where it comes from. Um, it is a world that is based on our world, but with D&D races. Uh, elves and orcs and goblins and halflings and gnomes have been here the whole time, to quote Samurai. Um, the guiding principle of the game was, what if magic was real, but it was gone? It had disappeared from the world at some point in the distant past, but then came back. Um, it was, un it was also pretty heavily influenced by an unearthed arcana supplement that never made it to full publication that I really liked about modern magic um, that, that talks about bringing sort of modern concepts, modern, and of course it's it's a supplement, so like modern weaponry, those sorts of things into a D and D five E setting. Um, I also pulled a lot from urban fantasy. Um, that is that's a genre that I really enjoy reading, and so some of the things that ended up playing into some of the plot lines for that game were things that were pulled sort of in allusion to or direct references to things like uh, the Dresden Files or the Mercy Thompson books. And so those are some of the things that went into building this world. Um, as it started, in terms of Harrigan Raiders categories, we started, in, I started writing this roughly in the fall of 2020, looking at my files before I moved them from a work computer over onto my personal one. Um, and so in terms of governance, uh, economic, social relations, and cultural influences, what was going on in the world at that time was very influential on what I wanted to see in sort of a fantasy setting. Um, we, When we started, the governance was pretty stable. So the, the things to do with like social supports were pretty strong. The government presence and sort of like the authoritarianism scale were pretty minimal as the campaign started. Um, There's a democratic government. Um, one of the things that we that I had to establish early on in sort of the history of the world was whether or not things like colonialism took place and whether we, okay. you know, whether we saw a sort of manifest destiny ideology happening in North America or whether I was going to say, no, we're going to get rid of that. And ultimately I did. Um, in terms of economics, there's was some inequality as we started. There was definitely still an upper class um, with 
it within the world. Um, it was fairly stable in terms of trade and agriculture that didn't necessarily feature a ton into the world building at the time. Um, and but there was an emphasis on sort of well, if if we have a less militaristic world that didn't wasn't impacted by colonialism as much, again, very very idealistic because well, the world in reality was very stressful <laughs> at the time. Um, how do we how what would that impact? That would that would of course change the technology to some degree because lots of te technological advancement happens as a result of military conflict. Um, and there was also sort of an emphasis on, again, it was my world, my rules, I wanted to do what I wanted. And so I did uh, an emphasis on reducing the amount of sapient made climate change, again, in the beginning of this sort of setting. Um, cultural influences, modern technology. We, we reach a point when the campaign started where I had things like cell phones, things like you know tablets. The internet was already a thing that existed in the world. Um, religion wasn't a huge factor at the beginning. That changes. Um, and social relations, again, mostly try to avoid some of the worst of both real world and fantasy racism. Um, if you all are familiar with any sort of history of D&D, that was something that we're still struggling with in the official supplements. Um, but so less of it, not none, but as a deep emphasis on culturally accepted systemic racism in the, in the setting. Um, and so what changed a lot, very, very quickly, um, to paraphrase something I once heard, no setting survives first contact with the players <laughs> and it, it didn't, and it should, uh, especially for something that we, you may end up playing for four or five years, 10, you know, or longer. There should be some investment there on the part of the people you're playing with. And so some of the things that changed immediately were some of the some changes to the history of the world and to some of the available uh DD <laughs> races that have that are in across 5e. I had a player who Pretty, pretty much immediately asked for a race, uh, the Warforge, that I hadn't even thought of. Hadn't been on my radar because it was an older race from a setting called Eberron in D&D. And so I didn't think anybody was going to ask for that, which was my mistake. Um, and so I had to figure out how does this race of, you know, sapient mechanical beings factor into what had been a pretty, pretty standard world. Um, and ultimately, we came upon they were a development of a group in, within the campaign, and they were a fairly recent addition to the world. So um, we thought. So we thought, yes. We'll Again, we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we also have, uh, there were also some pretty immediate changes to sort of economics and governance because I had a couple of players whose backstories included a pretty heavy element of their being crime and a criminal underground, much more so than I had initially thought of. Um, one player had a, a master forger as their parent, and another player decided that they wanted to play a police officer. And so in order for there to be a reason for those characters to exist, there had to be crime. There had to be an underground crime world. And eventually one player even decided that she wanted her backstory to include uh, organized crime, the mafia. And so I had to figure out how how does the mob fit into this world where I hadn't necessarily intended for there to be as much crime as happens in the real world. Um, and, and again, things like religion. We uh, There was a player that added a, a Rome analog. And so I had to figure out what was going to factor in in terms of sort of like ancient Roman religion? What was I going to pour over? Um, and so those things all changed pretty much immediately when we were starting the campaign before we even before we even sat down for our session one. These are some of these things came up in like a session zero where we were talking about the, 
the setting, talking about what was on the table and what was off the table in terms of conflict. Um, and so having that knowledge, I was able to incorporate those things a little bit more easily and be prepared inevitably, mostly for the questions that would arise about things like archaeology and world history. Um, and stuff is still changing. We're still playing. This is something we we were trying to shift this to a couple weeks out of every, you know, four or five, I think. Um, and so player choice, one of the things that I always when I like when I get asked about this, one of the things that I always say is the choices that your players make, whatever the whatever the plot is, whatever you have planned as the big conflict, whether it's, you know, magic returning, whether it's undead suddenly appearing, whatever. Right, the choices that your players make should be impacting the world, should be making changes on the small scale and maybe on the big scale, depending upon, again, how long this story goes on. Um, so some things that happen that have definitely changed the way that this is continuing to go on as we're still playing this. Um, characters have built relationships with different factions in the world. That's going to move those factions to being more prominent when we think about the story from the characters and the players' point of view. Um, one of one big one that uh, happened really, really early in the campaign was one of the first like mid-level bad guys that they that they came across. They decided to save and redeem rather than kill or like eliminate an arrest. And so that was uh, cool. compared with a very lucky role on the part of one of our players caused a pretty big shift in the way that that particular NPC exists in the world, but also the possibilities that exist for interacting with antagonists and ultimately interacting with, some, again, some of the groups that the, the players have had contact with. And so they ended up asking one of the groups that they were familiar with, one of the, one of the, a, a fake court that exists in the setting, to help rehabilitate her. And so she gets shown back up as an ally rather than as an antagonist for the party throughout the campaign. Um, other things that have changed as the plot has gone on and as the world has changed, the government has gone in the in the setting has gone from being sort of a, you know, benign force sort of middling to developing into some really heavy authoritarianism. And so the players justifiably have a deep mistrust of government institutions, even as they work with those institutions. And so that that's trended in a different direction than it was at the start of the game. Um, and some of the smaller things that can help with building sort of investment and, and, and world building um, are things like pulling NPC names or locations from player backstories. Or if you need a new NPC in the moment, one of the things that uh, our other DM does is asks us to name them, give them a physical trait, and give them a psychological trait. And that immediately ends up building a character with some sometimes very unusual and difficult quirks. But it makes the world feel more alive and varied than all of the NPCs, all of the people that these the players are interacting with, and that you as the you know the GM are, are embodying coming out of your own head. Um, and so those are some of the things that I really like that are little things that are still going on in our world. Um, okay, we will move into Q&A conversation, tips and tricks. I have down hidden sort of very small at the bottom of the page, my like file of tips and tricks that I've saved from social media, mostly Tumblr. But um, so like we can look at those as well. Yeah. Two questions, maybe for jumping off points. Um, I wanted to come back to something that you touched on very early with respect to world building. Um, you you had said something to sort of allude to the fact that we regard a lot of the standard fantasy setting as being kind of culturally blank or culturally empty. Like that's that's a perception that we have. Um, and you touched briefly on some of the ways in which 
you know, that that setting is not itself inherently political or cultural. Um, so first of all, like I was interested in you to expand on that a little just extemporaneously. And then if you had to go back to zero making Latira, what would you have done differently learning what you've learned along the way? Okay. Um, that one, that one's a bigger question, I think. Um, so in terms of the 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 sort of cultural stuff that's going on with the with classical fantasy fan, I think because and again, it, it all ties into the real world to some degree, right? We we see a lot of the assumptions of classical fantasy based in a sort of Eurocentric mindset. And so trying to very intentionally shift away from that, I think is something that can be really useful and and a way to make the world feel different than everything else else out there for sure. Um so that's that's one of the things that I think I really love. One of the reasons I really sort of resonated with that, the, the geography in mm -hmm. particular, because we, like you said, we tend to think of, of you know, Lord of the Rings and, and some of the others as like the baseline neutral when it isn't. It's, it's definitely very much based in this sort of European notion of what is folklore, what is fantasy and, pulling in thing intentionally pulling in things from other places like um one of the things that I do is uh I pull in some some Appalachian folk you know? um and and things like cryptids that are in the area um my, my characters have met the Mothman um so those are things that I do to try and sort of move away from it being just another sort of generic fantasy I like sure. the idea of using resources and geography as a jumping off point for that but I won't say any more because I know the critics of guns, germs, and steel will have me pilloried if I do. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I, again, like how much how much history do you want in your setting, right? Like the 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 rule that I heard, I don't know if it was Brendan Lee Mulligan or somebody else, is like go three answers deep, basically. And so you don't have to build the entire history of the you know the spread of cholera but in D, &D but but having the like having a knowledge of like okay well what trope what what stereotypes what tropes am i falling into can be really useful okay. um so. we'll, we'll come back to the latira question because i want to pop up here yeah. hey, you want to, this is a really stupid yeah. question but <laughs> are your players in Matera allowed to use guns? Do guns exist in that universe? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So yes, absolutely. This one is literally and constantly stocked with uh, the potions of ballistics resistance. Yeah, we uh, the, the the four of them over here are are uh, the people that I play with. And <laughs> yes, mean. absolutely. Um, and where where I got that from was that unarmed arcana that I mentioned, the modern magic one, because there are there's equivalence for like what's the ac of a kevlar vest right and what do, what damage does does a like semi-automatic rifle do and so adapt as long as you're consistent with them it's not usually too big an issue um and one of the things this is a little bit of a world building thing one of the things that i that i've established early on with the setting was that people who gained magic people who sort of interacted with the uh, were like the ones that could suddenly become druids and 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 sorcerers and whatever. They tended to be more resilient, and so that explained it, within the fiction of the world. That sort of is a help, a, a little bit of a help for explaining why I can have you know six six commandos show up with with fully automatic rifles and start shooting the party, and they don't all just immediately drop dead right um so things like that can, are little details that help establish like okay yeah why does this thing only do 2d8 or whatever right um and it, it helps it helps with that to some degree um yes question you about brought up like um you know, you don't need to know how to spread a color. What do you, what do you deal with players who have an extreme in-depth knowledge of something far more so than what you may have? And then you are now looking into something like that. Like a good example might be if a player is, if you have a setting on an aircraft and a player is like really knowledgeable about aircraft or so, and it turns out what you need to have in order to progress to what you plan doesn't actually work. Um, like, how do you deal with something like that? 
So for me, what I do is I lean in uh, to some degree. I lean into that knowledge like, OK, well, how would this work? What what would you think would be a good solution to this? And then sort of try and incorporate that a lot of uh, there's a lot of on the fly adaptation for sure, especially if there is knowledge of something like archaeology that is um, that is something I don't have as much of a background in. Sorry. Um, or genetics, yeah, limit squares. Um, <laughs> um, you'd ask what I would change if I went back to back to like zero with Latira. And I think one of the things that I would change is I would for, I, honestly for sure I would make the world less ideal than, than I started it out with because having less conflict in the beginning meant that I was relying really heavily on sort of the established plot beats that I had. Um, and once we got into the world a little more and started getting questions, started getting people's backstories in sometimes late, um, helped build up things that I could include that were that were places to interact and to bring in plot stuff that was either new or adaptations of stuff I'd already sort of planned on. Of course, the concern that I the collaborative elements, it, and that's what makes, I think, building a world for like a tabletop setting or any other shared settings different from like writing a screenplay um, is that you, you kind of have to take into account the people with whom you want to grow this thing and the people with whom you want to share it. And I think that with the players at the table, you may find that some players will have be more interested in the growing and then some players will be more interested in sharing. Like there'll be people that want to contribute heavily to the corpus of the world and there'll be people that want to draw upon that and more passively consume it. Absolutely, yeah. And and like within within our group, I think that that's a fair point to make for sure. Um, so it's hard to make sure that like no voice gets drowned out. Everybody has the opportunity. But then like you don't also don't want to push someone that doesn't want to create into the, into the spotlight. There, there. Yeah, um, one of the things I stole this one from Dungeons and Daddies. I do um, I do dad facts. Um, we have a discourse established for our our campaign where there are a couple of different uh, there are a couple of different channels for things that the players want to add about their history in the world, their their sort of interactions with it that I didn't come up with that are that are new and road specific to them. And so how much participation we have in that varies player to player, which is fine. Um, but yeah, that's one of the ways like I do those. I do another one I saw called loading screen tips. Yes. Where um, where sometimes like before the, the day of a campaign or the day before a campaign, I will just post like a little bit of, of world building lore um, and because it's the mod it's a modern setting I will sometimes be like oh this thing is trending on Latir and social media or this thing is in the news and so that is often often a hint of what might be coming up of course case it's gonna be a nightmare <laughs> um, something that you both do really really well and I think can be helpful in sort of making sure you give every player sort of a chance to, to latch onto something. Um, it does help to know your party for as long as we do. Um, but you guys both will sort of, Nathaniel specifically will make like an arc that is sort of geared towards a specific player, a specific character um, that is just basically full of, of hooks for them to sink their claws into, uh, or will purposefully put things into the world like archaeological sites, because uh, they know that the players are going to want to get into that. Uh, but that does sort of require you to like know the people you're playing with. Yeah, I think it's definitely a little bit harder, I feel like, for a, 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 a group that maybe just jumped in all together at like a game shop or something and doesn't have that background. But or like an online an online campaign because you don't necessarily know 
kind of what you're going into, especially until you actually sit down for hopefully a session zero and actually talk out stuff. But uh, but uh, with with you know friends with people you've known for a long time, you can you get I, I, absolutely you can sort of play into that. Um, our, our party, myself included, when I'm a player, all loves uh, masquerade balls and uh, and fancy events. Any excuse to describe an, a new fancy costume, right? And so those end up showing up quite a bit in all of the game, uh, all of our home games that we we play in for sure. So Something I like to do is call is um, specifically point at somebody and be like, OK, what do you think about this particular thing? Because sometimes people will, be, will want to talk, but they're um, they, they're shy enough that they don't want to talk over somebody or they don't want to talk if there's other people talking, but they are willing to contribute. So it might be something like if I'm in the middle of them, I might be like, what do you think about this particular thing? You know, person over here and that works for like and that could work for a pickup group. And if they don't, you know, give them a few seconds, don't pressure them. And if they don't uh, say anything, or maybe even give them a choice or two, you know, do you think it should do this or this? And that's a little bit more, that's less pressure than having to come up with something entirely on the spot. And it allows you to kind of uh, guide things a little bit as uh, as someone. So look, it, an example might be, you know, if you're working on a, if you're just doing a world and you're thinking about, okay, do you think that this place uses more public transportation or is it more car-based, you know? And then that's it, you know, or, Instead of just being like, so how do the people get around in this city? You know, something like that. If you're doing the more collaborative, like one shot stuff. Yeah, I run the Dungeon World campaign, and it, the rules explicitly say do this extremely often. <laughs> yeah, and I really, I really like that. I know that's something that I think that we 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 both try and sometimes do more or less, depending upon how many other things we're having to keep track of in our heads when we when we're in our system. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> When you edit this open to anybody at the table who builds worlds, how far a past where you expect your players to start and start engaging with stuff do you build? Like, do you mean like how much of a history? How uh, much runway like, you build ahead of you? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I've built a few worlds, and my favorite one, the first one that I ever built, I did it by myself with no group to play with, and I had continents. And I had ideas about how the culture in each continent worked, what the laws were, um, conflicts that were happening in each place. And then as I would get characters in to play this world, um, they would say, you know, I would play an Eric Okra. So I, I then would pick a location. Eric Okras most likely are from this place. And then I would expand on that place, even though that place has very little to nothing to do with where the actual campaign is. Sounds like it. I say that sounds more like what I did. Um, so just for reference on mine, my uh, the world I'm working on right now, it's my uh, I, be, I started with a creation myth mm -hmm. and worked my way from there. So it has a history, including an unreliable narrator in that history. And part of the uh, plot is actually determining what's wrong in that history that I gave the players to start with. Uh, there is a couple things I would point out. Um, one, you have to be kind of careful about that because uh, understand that a lot of what you write down is not going to get used. Yeah, and that's just because you know. About. Well, that's, yeah. that's, I have like yeah. a map, and then as players come in, like whatever race they're going to play as, where would that race have evolved in this map, and then build out from there. Uh, yeah, and I, I think I do something very similar. So there, there's very the, the map is mostly nothing except for like the pure environment. Like this place is a desert. This place is a forest. This place has lots of mountains, stuff like that. And then build it as draw draw a big map area and then just leave blanks for people to fill in as you go. And that was a mistake I made actually doing mine is uh, one thing that is because of where I had so much background built up is that my world is more static than uh, what theirs is. And uh, that's kind of caused it's it's something I'm working on at this point and it's, uh, it's something I would change if I was to go back and do it. So that is something to kind of be careful about whenever you're doing that is that it does make it harder for your players to enact their own change upon the world that you've made because you have so much inertia of history working against them in this case, which might be part of the idea. It might be that, you know, it is an uphill battle to make that change. Totally. And that, but there, there's actually 
very little historical momentum through most of it, other than the raw fact of the world itself being ancient, but the civilizations being more or less modernish. And what you described, though, to go back to actual world building, when you're doing that, you can come up with the um, you decide, OK, this Aarakocra comes from here. Why does why are Aarakocra more likely to show up here? Is it because this is a good area for them? Is it because that, you know, maybe the terrain happens to really uh, give advantage to people who can fly versus people who are land bound? Is it because they were forced there by something else? You know, that the why is always kind of a, a key thing to look at when you're doing that. So I'll give you your history. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, and this is something I would say about you mentioned Dresden Files, the, the Dresden Files RPG is on <laughs> Fay Court. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that Fay Court does as part of its mechanics that I've begun using, and essentially every game I've put together, is to try and figure out what the thematic through line is that's going to appeal to that player. Um, so it's very theme based. So if you've got a player that's, who's interested in the theme of rediscovering the past, then you you know that you need to make that a thread for the, the section of the world you're going to be in. I actually really like that concept in the Dresden is I think it's fate entirely. I haven't played many fate systems, but where you can have like an overarching theme and that can actually give you a mechanical advantage if you're drawing upon that. Yeah, that's you know. the of fate for you. Yeah. yeah. We had a very short-lived fate Dresden game a few years ago. I think we've got time for maybe one more question, comment. Microscope. Play microscope. Microscope. Oh, yeah, I've heard of it. It's a it's a what? game. Collaborative timeline building game. Yeah. Interesting. Build world and like it's it, you just you have a book and you have no card. You, you pick like a like a starting event. Yeah, and an, ending ending event. Event. And an ending event like yeah, around around the surface. The, the discovery of a new race on a new uh, continent and as a start and the end is the creation of the kingdom. And then you go back and forth defining this event happened. These are the major characters. And then you just kind of role play that out for a few minutes until you get a result. And no, no dice. It's all just, you know, we're going to sit here and tell each other a story. Yeah. That's really cool. It's, I'll have to, I'll have yeah, to look at back book. It's, it's, <laughs> it's called microscope because you zoom in and out across times. It's like a more oh, serious guys. version of. of it's not, yeah. it's not it takes a lot longer than you think to play when you're playing it, but it's a lot of fun. But we're probably going to have to dedicate like a day to it. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's I'll have to, yeah, definitely have to look at yeah, that. Look at your scope. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for coming. We're like right at out of time. We're um, amazing at this. We're we're. Um, We'll be around, so if you want to have like the hallway conversations that inevitably come up, that's cool. Uh, but yeah, um, if you're interested in any of the collaborative world building stuff, I actually I had the QR code um, for for the website just in case we ran out of these. It doesn't look like we did though, so go, feel free to grab the one of these if you haven't, um, and uh, go roll some dice later, I guess. Yeah. Thank you.